Okay, it's 10 o'clock. We're going to get started. If everyone in the Great Hall would like to join us, we are going to be starting the service. Welcome to Redeemer United Church of Christ, located in Sussex, Wisconsin. I am Jim Showalter, and I am liturgist for today. Please take a minute to fill out our who's where in the chair, either online or in person. We appreciate you connecting with us this morning. Here at Redeemer, we are learning to love more. Our pastor is the Reverend Julie Eklund, and today we are celebrating the fourth Sunday in Lent. Our welcoming music today is provided by Ann Matthews and Braden Schrock. Now please join in our opening meditation. First, make yourself comfortable. If you are seated, lengthen up through your spine, broaden through your collarbones, and let your hands rest on your thighs. Pay attention to your breath. With each inhale and exhale, feel your body getting more and more relaxed. Visualize an opening at the top of your head and a beam of light that connects you with the divine. Visualize two beams of light growing down through the soles of your feet connecting you with Mother Earth. 
Your connection with the vertical light above and below makes you feel safe, grounded, and supported like a tree with roots of light. Imagine a spark of light buried deep within your heart. It might be tiny. There might be darkness around it. You might feel removed from the light. But this spark is always present. Ignite the spark with intention. Nurture the light. Feed the light. Love the light. The light expands through your heart. Let your light shine. Feel your light grow brighter and stronger, filling up and surrounding all parts of you as you acknowledge your own true power, wisdom, and love. Let your light shine. Allow yourself to beacon in. Give yourself permission to become one with the light within you. Let your light shine. Remember that depending on where you are in your spiritual journey, your inner light might be dim or it might be bright. But if it's there, ready for you to tap into whenever you want. Connect with your light. Let your light shine. You are being carried by the light. You are being uplifted to a higher place. You feel elevated, expanded, stretched out, lit up. And now, from a place of strength and connection, share your light with others. Starting with the people closest to you, let your light shine. The light extends beyond people who are around you and is now nourishing the world. Allow yourself to beacon out. Remember that at any given moment, you can connect with your inner light. Bring divine light in and carry light out into the world. With a sense of gratitude and appreciation, take a deep breath. Come back to the present moment and make a commitment not to let anything or anyone dim your light. Let your light shine.
John 3.16 is probably one of the most infamous and oft-quoted scriptures in the Bible. What follows that verse is important for our Lenten journey. God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to offer it saving light. As believers in that light, we are called to be those who will continue to light up the world through our lives so that the world might see the hope it yearns for. today to call one another in from the shadows and bask in the light of your mercy. In this moment of quiet, we lift up to you those things we'd like to give up for good, for the sake of the good. Hear assurance in what the psalmist proclaims. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their inequities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and God saved them from their distress. God sent out God's word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. From Psalm 107. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. I invite you to stand if you are comfortable.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. These are the words of our still speaking God. Thanks be to God. Now it's time for a child and all of us, if anyone wants to come up. I got a hello. What's up? Thank you. I got a what's up. What was I? Nothing. Nothing. Man, you're a tough crowd. Well, welcome, welcome. Do we have anyone online this morning, Kyla? We do not. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, we're going to continue with up. Do you remember where we left off? Yes. Yeah, what? You do? Where did we leave off? I can't remember. I know. I think we left off um, with, uh, what's his name? Yes, and the bird. What's the bird's name? Kevin. I was blinking out. Had a moment. Okay, so now they found Kevin, right? Okay, then we have unexpected visitors. Bark, 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 bark. Oh, wait, no, how did they go? Bark, 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 bark. Is that right? The next morning, the fierce dogs burst from the bushes. They surrounded Carl, Russell, and Doug. Like Doug, the dogs had been sent on a mission to find the bird. Luckily, Kevin was hiding. The dogs took Carl and Russell to their master, this guy. Charles Muntz. Carl found out that Muntz had spent years trying to capture the bird. It says Carl's childhood hero is the enemy. He had no idea. Carl remembered his promise to Russell. He had to protect Kevin and get her back to her babies and Doug helped them escape. 
says, Muntz tries to explain, will Carl believe him? Carl's promise to Russell, protect Kevin. But Muntz caught them. He took uh, Carl's house and set it on fire. In the end, Carl let Muntz take Kevin so he could save his house. He loved it too much to let it burn. It says, Muntz sets Carl's house on fire. It says, give up Kevin. All right, that's, the, that's where we're ending today. So that wasn't a very ha a happy place to stop, was it? No. He saved his house instead of Kevin. What do you think about that? Very bad. Poor Kevin, yeah. He just wanted to finally capture the bird because people had never believed that such a huge bird existed. He didn't care about Kevin. Charles didn't. And he hated being thought of as a fool. And then Carl did a not so nice thing by letting Muntz have him right? Or have Kevin. I'm sorry, Kevin is a girl. And all because he was so attracted to his house and so sad that Ellie never got to go to Paradise Falls. So he got so distracted about Ellie and his house, he forgot to care about Kevin, right? Whew. Sometimes stories can tell the truth about how hard it is to be human, have you ever been disappointed or embarrassed or angry about something you did? No? You're, a, you're an angel all the time? Maybe? Okay, I'll take that as an answer. Have you ever tried to hide what you did? A couple times. Thank you for your honesty, right? Sometimes we try to hide things so other people aren't disappointed in us, right? But in our scripture for this week, Jesus tells us to shine a light on the things that hurt so we can see them and not be so afraid and own up to them, right? What we can do is we can look out for people this week who are afraid or hiding something, and we can light up their day with a smile or a kind word. Do you think we could do that this week? Yes? You gonna light up somebody's day this week? Yes? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to light up your day. Actually, Miss Sharon is gonna try to light up your day by giving you something to take with you and maybe you can pass it on to someone else and help light their day. Sharon shared with us pictures of hot air balloons. And so, may, do you have anyone have a space in your room where you can put pictures? No? Do you have a you can put it on your wall, okay. Or maybe your refrigerator. Do you have a place like a magnet that you can put pictures? I can put it on my wall. And your wall? We don't really have any more space for pictures. Oh, your refrigerator has so much stuff on it, there's no more room for pictures? Oh, there's room downstairs to hang it? Okay. Well, I'm going to put these pictures here. First, we're going to pray. And then, before you go back to your seat, you can pick one of these pictures to take with you to help you remember that we're supposed to be uplifting people's day and shining, shedding light on their day. Okay? All right. Can you help me pray? All right. Dear God... Thank you for Jesus and the light he brings. Help us to be people that shed light 
on others. Amen. All right. No one saw that. All right, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come seeking you and your guidance for our lives. Help us to be Jesus people that love more every day. And may the meditation of our hearts and the words upon my lips be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, this hot air balloon ride continues in our fourth week of Lent as we explore what Jesus was up to and discern what we can be up to instead of giving something up. So just a quick recap. Recap. We have Jesus had come up out of the water of baptism. He instructed the disciples to take up the cross and follow. And he foreshadowed the raising up of his body. Today, we will focus on light up with one of the most quoted verses of scripture, or should I say misquoted. All right, John 3, 16, the inclusive version says, yes, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one that whoever believes may not die, but have eternal life. And the NRSV version says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone may believe in him, may not perish, but have eternal life. Did any of you have to memorize this verse as a kid? I see yes. 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 You did? Oh, news to me. Where have, has this verse popped up a lot for you? Have you seen it on things? What? Sporting events? Oh, they just, that's true. Yeah, have you seen the numbers? Yeah. Yes. Okay, either the verse or the numbers. Where do they put them up on? Where do you see it on? Posters? Billboards? Anywhere else? A Keith Urban song? Yourselves, yeah, I've seen people have tattoos, like a cross, and then it says 316, tattoos, yes, yourselves. Bumper stickers, right? Wall decor, keychains. I see it a lot, because like when I'm like looking up stuff, like gifts to give people, I always see different things, and John 316, John 316. It's available on just about anything. Does anyone like this verse? Or I should say, does anyone not like this verse? You like it? He wakes up at 316. John, John 316. John wakes up at 316 in the morning. John 316. This is John's verse today. Okay, now that we know that John really loves this verse, is anyone brave enough to admit that they don't like this verse? Yeah, sometimes it feels exclusionary or made slash interpreted as exclusionary. 
Okay. I totally see that. It's boring. <laughs> Honesty. Honesty is the best policy. Any other thoughts? I think Lisa probably summed it up well, right? The verse on its own seems to mean belief in Jesus is the only avenue to eternal life. Or maybe some people interpret it that way, right? It also implies your goal in life is to get into the afterlife after you die, right? Otherwise known as eternal life, also AKA heaven, right? These implications then lead to questions about what it means to believe in Jesus. What facts do you need to believe? Like, do you have to have belief that Jesus was God's son, born to the Virgin Mary, raised by Joseph the carpenter? Do you have to believe that he performed miracles, was crucified on the cross, rose in three days, and now lives in heaven? Is that the requirements for the belief? Any thoughts? Maybe? Anyone know? I'm asking. No. No, okay. So what if you are someone who lives their life in discipleship, loving creation and loving others? Does that count? Yeah. But what if you don't know, if you, like, if you do that, but you don't know Jesus. Does it still count? Jesus knows you. Yeah. Or, or if you want to interpret this literally, can you just do whatever you want as long as you believe in the existence of Jesus and the facts of his life? Because if that's true, that makes this whole discipleship, discipleship thing a bit easier, don't you think? Too easy, yeah. So, the book we are reading for Redeemer Reads, are you reading it? Holy Currencies? Ooh, I like to see, I like it, the head nods, okay. Describes, this book is six currencies, right? Describes them, right? And of the six currencies is the currency of truth. And Eric Law describes the process of finding the truth as knowing the entire story from beginning to the middle to the end. You cannot know the whole truth with just a piece of the story. You have to be, so in other words, you have to be engaged with all of the Bible to seek the truth, not just a piece of it. That's also my plug for the Holy Currencies Retreat. Please sign up in the Great Hall. And John 3.16 is a good example of how this verse that people have plucked out for bumper stickers and tattoos does not stand alone. It has to be grouped with the sentences around it. The next verses read this. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So it goes on to say, right? Jesus came not to condemn. Jesus came to save, to bring light. Jesus came to light up the world. What do you imagine when you hear those words, Jesus came to light up the world? Expose the darkness. Mm -hmm. You think of the Debbie Moon song? Who's you Debbie Moon? Moon. You light up my life. You light up my life. Oh, oh, yeah. You light up 
of my life, you give me hope to carry on. That one? Yeah. Okay, that song. Okay. That's what I think of. You think of that? Any other thoughts? Good trouble. Okay. Imagine the flames in a hot air balloon that results in the balloon taking flight. Does that kind of feel like lighting up the world in a smaller scale so that things can be lifted and float and raise, rise up? Following the teachings of Jesus now is what lights up the hot air balloons of justice, of kindness, of compassion, of hope, of peace, of joy, of love. Showing light is how we elevate the goodness in the world. Ben Hensley from Worship Design Studio said this, Quote, I think there is a deeper way to read John's concern about belief in this passage. Because what if the importance of our belief isn't about orthodoxy, but instead is about our belief in God's power? What if we are saved because we believe God works in the world for good and we can participate in that goodness rather than believing certain correct doctrines about God, end quote. Maybe belief in Jesus means believing in goodness, in miracles and possibilities. It is important to spend the time needed to understand this scripture and what it really is trying to teach us. Because the Gospel of John can be dangerous when we interpret these words in binaries. Black and white, red and blue, right and wrong, left and right, good and evil, or as our passage says, darkness and life, belief or disbelief. Believe and be saved. Do not believe and be condemned. Love the darkness or come to light. We've been discussing during our Simple Soup Suppers that today's culture tries to force us into these binaries, but really most of life there is a lot of gray, or as I prefer, purple. In the darkness of the womb, the baby matures. In the darkness of the soil, the seed sprouts. From the darkness of the chrysalis, emerges the butterfly, right? So I don't think the Gospel of John intended this to be a binary that people live in either light or darkness. I think the writer was pointing out that if we are followers of Jesus, we have to shed light on the darkness or on the evil We have to be brave and expose what is evil or that which is not lifting up the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus didn't come to condemn, but to expose so changes could be made. And that is exactly what he died for, right? He exposed the Roman government, right? The corruption and the corruption of the religious leaders. He exposed it, shed a light on it, and the people living in oppression couldn't. They had no voice to expose it. But Jesus came to say, this is wrong. Your rules and your beliefs or your correctness are oppressing others. So if we want a just world for all, we have to be able to name that which is not working. 
We must call out that which is oppressing. We cannot pretend it is giving light when it is not. We have to be real and honest evaluators of life. We know that no person or system or country or government is perfect, right? We have to ask what is corrupting goodness? This week, the Reverend Rachel Bauman, our Associate Conference Minister, challenged the Council and the Pastoral Relations Committee with this. Where are you experiencing God's presence and movement with Redeemer right now, and how would you describe it? What elements are there that seem to be participating with and supporting the Spirit's presence and movement at Redeemer? What elements are there that seem to be inhibiting or constraining the Spirit's presence and movement? The questions about the presence of the Spirit were rather easy for me. Yes, yes, this, there, woo, yeah. I struggled with the inhibiting and constraining to really pin it down, to name it. I continued to discern that question throughout the week. And finally, by Friday morning, I felt like I had a good answer. The spirit is being inhibited and constrained at Redeemer when we focus too much on our scarcity. That scarcity mentality causes us to focus on our lack of financial resources, our lack of people attending worship, our lack of volunteers. Instead of asking questions on how we can connect with our community, We are asking questions on what fundraisers can we do and how can we bring in more money and bring in more people? In essence, they are both the same question with hopefully a similar outcome, but we either start from a place of fear or we start from a place of abundance in the spirit, the light. We start with the light. So I challenge you this week to ask the spirit questions for your personal life, your work life, your community life, your church life. Where is the spirit's presence and where is it being inhibited? And really shed light on what needs to be named. Be bold, Redeemer, and light up. Amen. Please join in singing our song of reflection, I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. Um, So this is a newer contemporary song that some of you may have heard already, um, but for those of us that may not be familiar with it, we are blessed to have the incomparable Becky Olson uh, leading us today. So she's going to sing the first verse through, then we're all going to come in together and repeat it together, and then we'll move on to the refrain and just uh, celebrate God's love for us. Sea. Your river runs with love for me. 
The prayer person of the week, or the prayer persons, I should say, are Megan, Brian, and Nathaniel Everts. Contact information is found in your bulletin or will be in this week's Redeemer Reminders. We have a request from Catherine and Eric Richardson for Tom Richardson. Please pray for Tom, who is dealing with some health issues. Kim and Mary Olson are requesting prayers for Elena Davidoff, who is having shoulder replacement surgery on Wednesday. Lisa Morris is requesting prayers for Sarah, who is a coworker having brain surgery tomorrow. Linda and Fred are requesting prayers for Becky Grabner, it's actually a prayer of praise. She is flying to Switzerland tomorrow to meet up with Greg, who is her soon-to-be fiance. And it says comma for the next 10 days. I don't assume that he's only gonna be a fiance for the next 10 days. <laughs> and she's pray asking prayers for their safety for them all around. And these are the prayers of the people. O God, on the powerful transformation that occurs when we allow our journeys through this life to be witnessed by others. Rather than hiding our imperfections and denying our fully human selves, we accept your call to offer our light, to show up just as we are in this community. And we pray that we can be up to something good for ourselves, our neighbors, and our world. And so this week we start with thanksgiving for these acts of uplifting goodness. We give thanks for Megan, Brian, Nathaniel, for all the many ways they bring light to Redeemer and their family, friends, and community. We give thanks and for the engagement of Becky and Greg, for her travels and safety. We give thanks for new friends, for singing solos, for music and light. Let my prayer rise up, my incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. We call upon you, O God, to incline your ear and extend your love and healing power for these laments. We, la we lament for war gun violence, destruction for mass tragedies. We lament for those who are struggling with addiction, who are victims of abuse, for those who are scared, for those who are suffering with mental health, for those who are in search, for Tom, for Elena, for Sarah. We 
call upon you, O God, to give us the strength and courage to be up to something good for the sake of the good. In this moment, in our mind's eye, we imagine and offer our commitment to one small thing this week that will lift someone up, elevate and affirm the good when we see it, and bring a bit more calm or joy where we are. And if we find we are not up to it, we pray we can accept the goodness of others and feel your encouraging love. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ushers, please collect the offering. Today, we rejoice in a God who comes to redeem the world through a pouring out of divine love. Our rejoicing is offered with the generosity of our energy, our spiritual gifts, and our treasure. We are invited as God's beloved children to express our rejoicing this day through the giving of our gifts in love. May it be so. The 55 campaign, perhaps you're wondering what is Redeemer up to? We are celebrating 55 years by building our youth program to 55 youth and raising $55,000 to sustain our current programs and events, as well as a goal of having seed money to hire a part-time youth faith exploration position. We are accepting gifts in all amounts to help reach our goal. Blue envelopes are available in the chairs along the center aisles or in the Great Hall. Grab an envelope today and show your support. We are just over halfway through the campaign and we've received 54 envelopes containing $16,258, which is 31% of our goal. Our gold can is for one great hour of sharing and I believe we have a video to show. And if we don't have a video to show, I will continue. <laughs> Okay, I believe that we might be having some technical difficulties, but in any event, one great hour sharing is definitely worth contributing towards. Uh, so please be generous in that regard. You may also give your offerings online at our website or mail into the church. And many thanks for your generosity. Let us pray. Thank you, God, 
for loving us to the very ends of the earth and back, your willingness to say yes to coming in the flesh to redeem our world through love and no to the powers of oppression has led us to give of ourselves generously this day. Take these gifts and multiply them across this world that you love so extravagantly. Amen. Now please join in singing our departing song, Jesus, the Light of the World. shadows that you face and that in the longest nights of uncertainty and doubt that you have all you need to be up to something when someone asks you what are you up to you can respond with God's help I'm up to something good let the people say amen amen thank you Jim for being your liturgist this morning excellent as always and take it away with the announcements We'd like to thank everyone who made this morning possible. For worship, we'd like to thank Anne, John, and Braden. For Zoom, Kyla Steffen. Our greeter today was Sue Yonk. Our usher, Bonnie Seidlists. And our fellowship hosts, the Eggert family. And Becky Olson. Absolutely. For our fellowship hour, we need volunteers to bring refreshments for the 9 a.m. fellowship time. If you would rather donate food items or money only, please contact Tony Knutson. We only have two Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. for simple soup suppers. Pastor Julie will lead simple soup suppers. I like saying simple soup suppers. Uh, please sign up if you plan to attend. Soup and bread volunteers are wanted. Redeemer cooks for the community banquet on Thursday, March 14th at St. James Catholic Church. Please sign up to volunteer. We have a date change for our spring garden workday. It is now March 16th at 10 a.m. The facilities and prairie teams are seeking volunteers to help with pruning trees and shrubs and cleaning up the sanctuary garden and landscaping beds as spring is fast approaching. No experience necessary, but feel free to bring work gloves, rakes, garden shears, trimmers, garbage cans for hauling, etc. if you have them. Ann Weed will be sharing her pruning know-how with us that you can use at home to spruce up your own yard too. Please use the Sign Up Genius to let us know if you are coming. And questions can be directed to Fred Smith, Ann Weed, or Ann Matthews. Let's be wise. Please sign up for the Family Perspective NAMI presentation 
next Sunday, March 17th at 11.30 a.m. Our Monday Thursday service uh, is on March 28th at 6 p.m. We're asking folks to sign up to let us know if you're coming and volunteers are wanted to bring soup and bread. Please sign up to attend our Easter brunch and egg hunt on March 31st at 9 a.m. Volunteers are wanted to help set up, take down, and bring food. And as Pastor Julie mentioned earlier, there is a Holy Currencies Retreat here at Redeemer on April 27th from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. The cost is $15 and includes your lunch. Now that's a good deal. If you need a copy of the book, they are available to purchase for $11. And finally, last but not least, we have our CCEMT meeting following worship and we need your help to raise Redeemer up. So go forth and take action and have a wonderful day. Light up. Light up. <laughs> <laughs>